Hello, and welcome to Behind the Music, where we take an inside look at the music you'll hear on North Carolina Symphony programs. I'm Michelle de Russo, assistant conductor of the North Carolina Symphony. This weekend, the symphony will perform a program featuring 20th century works that expand upon the forms and styles of the more distant past. Plus, J.S. Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 3, all conducted by Stephanie Childress. Let's begin our journey with Johann Sebastian Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 3. This concerto is part of his famous collection of six Brandenburg Concerti, and the story behind it might sound a bit familiar to you. In 1721, Bach gathered six instrumental concertos that he had composed over the last decade or so and presented them elegantly to the Margrave of Brandenburg as part of his job application in hopes of getting an appointment in his court in Berlin. Bach presented these works to show himself at his best and as a portfolio that would display his potential as a composer. Although these concerti are among the greatest glories of Baroque instrumental music and are perhaps the best known of his works, Bach unfortunately did not get the job. There also seems to be no evidence that the Margrave even saw his work or performed it. So how did these works finally make it into the public eye? Initially, the works remained in the Margrave's library until his death, then were passed on to his heirs and sold in an estate evaluation. They were not discovered in the archives of Brandenburg until 1849 and were finally published in 1850, a hundred years after Bach's death. What makes this concerti so special and revolutionary is the way Bach uses the concerto grosso, one of the most important types of Baroque instrumental music. The composer provides a spectacular variety of instrumental techniques of the period in his own style and manages to enhance the spirit of the lively, sophisticated court entertainment. The concerto grosso, which means big concerto, employs a small group of soloists that alternate with a full orchestra. Through the contrast that this alternation generates, Bach exploited this characteristic to the fullest by using unimagined and unprecedented combinations of instruments for each concerto. That is why each work has its own distinctive color and character. Some say that this could have been one of the reasons that made them unsuitable for the resources of this particular court. The third concerto is scored for strings alone excluding the winds from this work. He uses a unique arrangement of three violins, three violas, and three cellos, in addition to the usual Baroque tradition of bass and harpsichord. There is no soloist, but most of the instruments take turns assuming a solo role, which leaves it to the listener to define the line created between the alternations of large and small groups of instruments. The relationship between the various instrumental lines which is referred to as texture in music, is wonderfully demonstrated in the first movement. Instead of customary slow movement, Bach creates an enigma by writing two chords which function like an incomplete punctuation mark designed to lead into the final movement. This has led interpreters to add a cadenza before we move on to the finale. Listen for the cadenza and look for which instrument or instruments are playing. The final movement begins in a fast tempo, set to rhythms of a chic, which reminds us that Bach's music is never really too far from dance. The next piece we will perform is Respighi's Ancient Airs and Dances, set number three. Respighi was one of the most imaginative orchestrators of the first part of the 20th century, and although most of his studies took place in Italy, he spent two years in Russia that forever shaped his orchestration techniques and he studied with no less than the master of orchestration, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov. Thanks to these studies, he developed his use of instrumental color and sonority, rooted in the late romantic tradition of colorful virtuoso orchestra textures. To this romantic style, he integrated a deep interest in the Italian music of the Renaissance and Baroque periods. This unusual combination of stylistic elements created a unique musical style that is recognizable and cannot be mistaken with any other composer. Respighi was also a scholar of early music, studying the music of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. This resulted in the composition of three suites for orchestra 
ancient airs and dances, suites one, two, and three, which were based on Italian and French lute music from the Renaissance that accompanied dancers and singers. The first suite was composed in 1917, the second in 1923, and the third one in 1931. While we perform the suite number three, written for string orchestra, try to listen to what characterizes Respighi's musical style. The first movement, Andantino, will be based on an anonymous Italian popular melody of the early 17th century with a simply graceful and slow tune. The second movement gathers six numbers from the airs of the court by Burgundian lute player Jean-Baptiste Vessard, creating a suite within a suite. The third movement is in a distinctive ABA form inspired by an anonymous pastoral Siciliana from the early 17th century and the final movement closes with a passacaglia, a short repeated bass line or harmonic progression from Italian guitarist and composer Ludovico Roncalli. Closing the concert is Prokofiev's classical symphony and there is no one better than Prokofiev himself to explain the intent behind his first symphony. It seemed to me that if Haydn had lived into this era, he would have kept his own style while absorbing things from what was the new music. That's the kind of symphony that I wanted to write, a symphony in the classical style. His decision to give the work its familiar nickname seems to have been derived from a logical reference to its sources and from his secret hopes that in time, his symphony might turn out to be a classic. And I'm happy to confirm that his wishes actually came true. Following the model of Mozart and Haydn, Prokofi wrote this symphony in four movements, but on a small scale. Each movement is so compact that the entire symphony is only 15 minutes long, shorter than most of Mozart's or Haydn's symphonies. He used traditional forms from the classical period, but added dramatic content to that mold. For example, the first movement uses a traditional form, but is filled with crisp irony on how it is presented. Listen for the recapitulation and its unexpected tonal behavior. The second movement then spins a long lyrical melody in the violins and flute. Prokofiev placed this melody in a high register on purpose, a decision that would have probably been avoided by a classical symphonist. The third movement might be familiar to you. It was such a success during the premiere of the symphony that Prokofiev decided to insert it into his Romeo and Juliet ballet score later on in 1935. Do you recognize it? The fourth and final movement provides a brilliant finish where Prokofiev continues with his witty parody, exploring unusual modulations until the very end. I hope you enjoyed learning more about neoclassicism in music with me and that you're able to find the similarities between the pieces that create wonderful connections through periods of time and music. We can't wait to see you in the concert hall. <laughs>